I've been very outspoken against DEI. I think that, look, everybody's talking about this equality of outcome. To me, that is absurdity. That is absolutely absurdity. You want to talk about equality of opportunity, which we don't have in America, that should definitely go on the to-do list. We should work to level the playing field, give everybody an equal start. We don't have it. We should work towards it. If we want to create any kind of level playing field, the place to do is go back to the schools in the beginning where they have a poor tax base, poor tax funding for the schools. I, I get it. Those schools need to be just as good in the inner city as they are out in the suburbs. They need to have the same resources, the same quality of teaching, same opportunities for those kids. I understand that. You can fix that in one generation if you give them the same opportunities. But this idea of lowering standards to reach some kind of quota, I read that same study out of UCLA. I'm sorry. I don't want a doctor that they lowered the standards in you know, some class on anatomy and physiology or brain function or any part of medicine, and that person gets through and then you meet them up at the hospital. Don't, I, I'm sorry. No, thank you. And, and that's the issue is that what we've been trying to do and what I did for decades now since 9-11 is redefine what diversity is. We formed a Muslim reform movement that was really trying to educate the Obama administration that diversity is ideological diversity. We have a group of, of Muslims that are pro-Western, that are anti-Islamist, that came together because we're conservatives, liberals, feminists, gay rights activists, free speech activists, so many different. I've worked with Ayan Hirsi Ali's organization, who's a former Muslim, uh, with atheist groups, all of which are diverse, but joined together to say we want to save the West because secular Western liberalism is under attack globally. 70% of the world is living under dictatorship. And that is part of wokeism. And wokeism is really about... Um, you know, the ideas that somehow our identities are all that matter. And you find medical schools, medical organizations now starting meetings saying that we have, we will start this meeting by declaration that this is on stolen ground. This apologia is, is not only pathological, it is an insult to every minority that somehow we have this bigotry of low expectations. And I can tell you every, I, as the son of immigrants and as, as, as an Arab American, Syrian American, whatever hyphen you want to put in front of my name, the bottom line is, is that my children are raised to where they want to achieve something because they earned it, not because they had a participation prize, which is what is the death knell of the future of our next generation. Yeah, And it's so unfair because you meet one of these doctors in the hospital, for example, and everybody looks at him like, oh, did you get here because... They gave you special dispensation to get here. So for the doctors that earned it, they did come up through a meritocracy. They did have excellent performance. Everybody looks at them askance like, oh, are, you're one of the DEI doctors. And for those who actually earned it and worked their way up, it's unfair to them because everybody looks at them like, oh, you got a free ride. And I know some doctors that deal with that every day. It's not fair to and, them. And by the way, as somebody who hopes to be a future congressman, you know, Congress has some fixes for this. And uh, Governor DeSantis has been talking about it. There are different uh, uh, state and federal laws that can be simply enforced in which you can't have preference over some one race versus another. You can't uh, uh, simply ignore standards of education. You can't start indoctrinating people, especially in hate speech like anti-Semitism and, and giving them preference over others and then expect to get federal grants. Uh, we should be deporting folks, the students that uh, are on, on privilege here to study on visa that are espousing support for foreign terror organizations. I mean, there are things happening that the federal government, if we didn't have rubber stampers like the Greg Stantons of the world that is now representing this district here, if he, if he actually would use his own critical thinking and had not had actually had the courage to censure Rashida Tlaib when she came to raise money for students for justice in Palestine, it would be a, a whole different world and you'd see pushback because I truly believe 
And I'm finding this knocking door to door and across the district that 80% of America in the center, center, we're a center right country, but 80% across that middle don't like any of these radicalizations that are happening. And we need to, this is why right now you see so many folks coming across our border that are Hamas sympathizers, radicals. Ultimately, they, they, the Democrat Party thinks they're going to be voting, I think, for them. And that's why they don't want ID for voting. But they're also bringing drugs. They're bringing crime and, and destroying our neighborhoods here as a border state. And you have it in Arizona, just like we do in Texas. If we've got people, however they got here, whether it was on a student visa or whatever, if we've got foreign students here that are actively demonstrating against the United States on an American campus, why in the world do we allow those people to remain? They are working against our interest. They are sympathizing with those who are calling for a death to America. And we have admitted them into the country, and then we watch them demonstrate for our downfall. Why would we allow those people to remain in America? This is the thing I've been calling for vetting of people coming in before they come in, not after. And we need a real border security plan. I mean, Dr. Phil, they've been they've been gaslighting us saying, oh, the last plan was a bipartisan plan. I guess they call bipartisan two senators and a, a couple of congressmen that are Republican that voted for it. When, in fact, true bipartisanship is when a, a majority of the majority and a majority of the minority vote for something. And that's actually how bipartisanship works. And as the son of immigrants, you know, my parents waited, came here legally and then got political asylum because they would have been imprisoned and tortured. My grandfather was in and out of prison in Syria. So these are the narratives that create and bring the people that we want in America that are gonna work harder than, than they've ever worked in their lives because they appreciate the freedoms they have here. And my border security plan goes through what a real security plan would look like. I'm the only Republican in the primary here that actually has a plan. And the other candidates, actually, uh, uh, Kelly Cooper, who's the primary uh, other contender, has just this pablum that seems to be out of the liberal Democrat Party. And yet, as the son of immigrants, I can tell you that, um, you know, we, in respect for our immigrants, need to have a tough border plan, because then it makes immigration something that everybody can wrap their head around, can embrace and say, that's what Americanism really is. Well, I agree. And you do have a border plan. You've got Zudi Jasser's border security plan. Number one, seal the border. The sheer scale of illegal immigration is overwhelming our system and laws. There's no question about that. Then number two, you say reclaim congressional constitutional authority. Congress should set immigration policy, not the president. The Constitution grants Congress the power to make all laws, including the rule of naturalization. The Supreme Court has consistently affirmed congressional authority to set immigration policy, but that's not happening. It's just not happening. And then you say intensify vetting. Is there any vetting to intensify? <laughs> That's exactly correct. Right now, the only vetting is they cross match. As you know, last week, there were nine different ISIS operatives from Tajikistan that were revealed to have been in four different cities, L.A., San Francisco, New York. And they were found because they ended up uh, being found to be cross matched with ISIS connections and, and communicating with them. And luckily, nothing happened. But it needs only one to to be part of that implosion, God forbid, of terror that they can bring with them with the ideologies that are anti-American. And they're not vetting. We should be vetting for do they truly have they come to us first or did they come through three other countries? Because if they came through three other countries, as we're seeing, most of the people at the border are, are not Mexican. They, they've come from Bangladesh, from from uh, China, from Africa, from all over the world. And come through five or six countries before they get here. So they should get asylum in that first country. My father and mother asked for asylum in Lebanon when they left Syria. And then my dad had an internship here and got accepted. Once he got his acceptance for internship, was approved for the asylum. And then they came here to Ohio. And then ultimately, I grew up in Wisconsin. So that's how asylum is supposed to be done. And I think we need leaders in Congress that get it, that are pro-immigration, but anti-illegal immigration and have the courage to say, you know what, enough of this amnesty stuff. We need to deport Biden's illegals. 
the millions that have come in in the last three years need to be deported. And then we can deal with Obama's illegals and all of the others before that that are in the tens and tens of millions. Well, we've got three Islamist organizations on college campuses, American Muslims for Palestine, Students for Justice in Palestine, Muslim Student Association. These are all pro-Hamas. These are people that have joined the organization. They're being funded by outside, but they have fortunately self-identified. Can we not start there and start getting these people out of here? Exactly. But as you know, that's like the 0.1% tip of the iceberg. As you can see there, I was testifying uh, to Congress back in 2013 uh, on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, testifying to the Homeland Security Committee, Foreign Affairs Committees, and telling them, listen, the anti-Semitism in America is coming because at that time, Al Gore had sold his satellite television to Al Jazeera America which is a Qatari information organization that spreads radical Islam. And if you look right now at the operations of October 7, number one funder was Qatar. Number two was Iran because of the billions that Biden released to Iran. But Qatar, through its information operation, has radicalized Muslims and Arabs across the world. And they have a viewership of 60 million a day. Now, thankfully, that their, their network did not succeed. It fell apart despite the half a billion dollars, they, they, uh, billions of dollars they dumped into it because there was no market for it. But there was no counter narrative. As you and I were just talking before about universities, if you don't have a counter narrative about what Americanism is, why we should be unapologetically not only pro-American, but anti-communist, anti-Islamist, that that's part of being human beings and supporting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, We don't. That's the thing is we won the Cold War without ever firing a bullet against the Soviets because we had a U.S. information agency, a Radio Free Europe that was advocating for the ideas of Americanism unapologetically. And we don't have that now. And that's what I had testified before and what we need to have through our universities here at home first and then do it abroad. 